Welcome to the Jill on Money Show. It is Sunday, September 8th, and we are continuing our two-day episodes with Blair Ducanet. She is not just a CFP, she is also a CFA. I call her the queen of Ritholtz Wealth Management. She's an investment advisor, and she's a darn good one. Yesterday, we talked about what got Blair into the business, and today we are going to actually follow up with the difference between what a CFP's training is like, what a CFA's training is like, what you need to know about that if you have a financial advisor who has one of those designations. If these two conversations conjure up questions about whether or not you need financial advice or whether the person with whom you are working is worth it, give us a holler. Go to jillonmoney.com, click the Contact Us button, and of course, let us know if you would be willing to come on the air live. While you're on the website, don't forget, we've got the YouTube show connection there, Jill on Money Powered by the Compound. That's where I first recorded this interview with Blair, and you can see the actual video if you'd like. And also check out our subscription service called Jill on Money Live. I'm very excited because our next live webinar for anyone who is a member of Jill on Money Live is on Tuesday, September 24th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. We are doing a real estate spectacular. We're going to have a mortgage broker and a realtor. We're going to talk about the new real estate rules and everything that goes into buying a house today. And remember, this will be after what we think is going to be the first rate cut of this whole interest rate cycle. So check it out, Jill on Money Live, 35 bucks. Okay, right now, let's get to the second part of our interview with Blair Ducanet. What do you think is misunderstood out in the universe of consumers, of clients out there about the work that CFPs and CFAs and wealth managers do? What do you think that people still don't get? They probably still think we're all just trying to make a a sales commission, Mm -hmm. would be my guess. Um, Financial advisor, again, the reason I'm fine at a party saying I'm a financial advisor and not try to make it anything fancy like I help people accomplish their goals and dreams or whatever those elevator pitches are that the consultants tell you, um, is because, you know, most people still have a negative assumption about what financial advisors do, you know, that we're sitting at the desk, calling people about stocks, trying to make a sale and a commission, and that there's this, you know, adversary um, relationship going Mm -hmm. on there. I think a lot of people don't know, but the people who know and know that they want that, Mm. it's pretty easy for them to find a CFP. They they figured out, they figured it out. Oh, I need somebody to help me figure out how to save and invest for retirement or whatever the goal is. They, they get it. Do you think that we kind of blew the whole fiduciary conversation? 100%. Oh, right? Yeah. Okay. So, like, this is one of the bugaboos that I have, which is after the financial crisis, it could have been a great moment for every single, uh, every single one of these firms to come out and be like, you know what? We're fiduciaries. We put you first at all times. And they're also freaked out by litigation. But those lawsuits are going to come no matter what. So- what is it like that everyone's so scared about that? Could you imagine going to a doctor or a lawyer or a CPA and they like, they may tell you what's suitable for you, but it may not be in your best interest. That is insanity. That's not a profession, is it? We don't have a profession. I mean, that's what it all boils down to is we never had one. We never had. I mean, we've got a patchwork of credentials. Some of them are great um, with continuing education, but we never had a profession. Right. We missed it. It was like you had to become a profession in the early 1900s. <laughs> Otherwise, you're done. <laughs> well, I mean, I always thought that maybe if um, if like the the universe aligned that we could get there. I do think look, I do I think that like regulation is kind of catching up to where we should be. Yes, but I kind of do feel like it's a little late. Like all right, your best effort. That's nice. A night. But like why is it so hard to say which I asked a CEO of one of these big firms, why is it so hard to say that we put your best interest first? Well, that's not their business model. I mean, the whole business model of the broker-dealer exception was that they aren't held to a fiduciary standard, and that's what those companies are built around. So they're not going to change their stripes because they have shareholders, they have managers to pay, right? They have profits to make. So that's just not the business model. And unfortunately, the lobbying effort behind that is so strong that, you know, you've seen efforts by the DOJ to try to tackle it from the retirement angle. 
So I don't know. I mean, I always think that it takes a catastrophe for something like that. To That's really why change. I thought after the financial crisis, it, it would be happen. fantastic. That was like the moment, like you're on your knees. That's when the regulators could have said, OK, you're on your knees. Here's the new rules. You want the money? Here's the rules. Right. I know we blow it. Um, so remind me about the op ed that you wrote, which is how we first became uh, girlfriends. <laughs> right. So what was the nature of the op ed? Tell everybody and maybe we'll even put a link to it in our show notes. Well, the title was salacious. Of course, the New York Times wrote the, the title. How dare they. But um, I knew what the working kind of concept was because I had written on my blog, The Bell Curve, something similar. Um, and, and the reason I wrote it, and it, by the way, the title is Consider Firing Your Mail Broker. OK, so I had written an article about why women stereotypically have the characteristics that made them better investors, better advisors, and how there aren't enough women in the advisory space. And at that time, I'd been working 12 or 13 years, hadn't seen the needle move. And I wanted to just point it out, like, this is a great career. Women stereotypically are well suited to listen to people, to try to help them. It can be fulfilling. And oh, by the way, you have control over your time. And it might actually be lucrative. So I was trying to convince more women to come into the profession. Probably didn't. I don't know if it moved the needle or not. Hopefully there are some young women who have read that and other things and have said, okay, it's not. It hasn't really moved the needle. So I think it's still yeah. like 25% of CFPs, 20 to 25% yeah. are women. It's sort of been stuck there. And like far fewer if you, God forbid, you want a black woman. Because uh, our, the numbers for CFPs of color are abysmal, right. absolutely abysmal. And so we need more women, more people of color, and we need people helping their communities. Um, I met you through that because I was talking to Michael Goodman about it. He's like, I know Blair. <laughs> and then I was like, hook me up, brother. And we brought you on the show, which was fantastic. And, and then how, how long av- um, did the effect of writing that kind of op-ed, how, how did that impact your career and your your practice? There was a lot of media frenzy. You know, CNBC wanted me on there the first day. That died down pretty quickly. But every now and then, I still have people reach out who have read it and who want to talk to me or who want me to be on their podcast. So it still lives on today. That's so great. And when what do you write the podcast, uh, the the blog? Like, what does that serve for you? The Bell Curve is your blog. Everyone should subscribe to it. What, what purpose does that serve for you? I love writing. You and do. a writer's going to write. So that's the purpose it serves for me. Um, and the, the content comes from, sometimes I'll get the same question from clients three times, and I know there's a blog post there. Or sometimes what's going on in, in my daily work and the news coincides, or there's something that I feel very strongly. I know when I'm like mad or angry about something, those are some of the best posts. Like really? When I have like a chip what? On my shoulder. Tell us uh, more. When I went after insurance is not an investment, you Ooh. know, those kind of things. That That's when we had like people calling in that wanted to chew me out about that one. So what's funny about that is, um, when I talk to, you know, I have a podcast, I have a radio show, and sometimes they'll say to me, like, Blankety Blank Insurance Company wants to. I'm like, okay, but just to be clear, they should read some of the things I've written or they should listen to the show because I try, I'm, I'm better at it now, but I started because soon after I came out of the advisory business and I came into media, the problem was that often I would inherit a big problem, and many of the biggest problems I ever inherited were from insurance products. And they're hard to undo. They're really hard to undo. So I was bitter about that. Now I'm trying to say, okay, I have to believe there are some well-meaning people in this industry. Please come forward. I'd love to talk to you. Like, let me just know. Like, you do need insurance. A lot of people need insurance. You need insurance. It's just that it cannot be that you create a profession where every single problem is solved with insurance. Right. It's impossible. And annuities. Uh, the, okay, so can you school me? Um, what about, should I be on the lookout for interesting um, lower cost annuity products? Are there any out there? You probably should because you know interest rates are out of the tank. That's it. And the best use of an annuity is to secure a fixed income stream for the rest of your life. Right. So. Absolutely. I think there are a lot of American retirees who should probably delay their Social Security as long as they can, 
and take a chunk of their savings and lock in the rest of their basic spending needs with an annuity. Now, it didn't make sense for a long time because the higher the interest rate, the more income you get. So you'd have to fork over tons of savings to get that income with Mm -hmm. low, low interest rates. Um, That's the best use of them. Just so happens that annuity salespeople are not incentivized in terms of commission to sell those as much as they are, those variable products. And all right, because these are immediate annuities. The chunk of money goes in. You start the clock. You get a it, paycheck for life. Whether you live to 88, 99, or 105, you've just secured your income. And, ha- I mean, the, it, the, incentive, uh, the incentive is off, right? Because we know that. Right. It's the same thing. Like, you make piddly squat on a term life insurance policy. You make a lot of money on a whole life and policy. Uh, so when is a whole life policy actually on the table? I say whole life. When is a permanent, permanent policy on the table for you as an advisor? If there's an estate tax. Yes, because you know what? We very, need something for your entire life. It's a very few people now because the estate tax exemption at the federal level is 26 Except million. your clients with their $7 million and more. Right. Um, children with special needs. Yeah. Right. So a term means I'm buying cheap insurance while my kids are young, and one day I won't need that insurance anymore because they won't be reliant on my income. Um, but um, business owners, right? Buy sell agreement. What ha- yeah. What happens to my business partner if I die and my wife owns my share? I want to have the liquidity of the insurance product for that. Um, I'm sure there's a few that I've missed. Um, but that's a pretty small um, number of folks out there who should right. be thinking about that, and. As you said, you know, these products that are sold, not purchased, like someone said, I was so stupid to buy this. I said, no, you really weren't. It was sold to you. Right. It really was. And so what do people, I mean, when you inherit one of these po- these annuities, like you've got some old, you know, oh, well, I have a um, equity index annuity and I can't lose money on the way down and I just, I give up a little bit on the way up. How do you explain that to the people who've already made the decision, they have gotten themselves that that product. What do you do with that? Because you don't want to make them feel like an idiot. Well, if they're talking to me, they've probably realized they need to make a change. Yeah. Um, but these things can't just be blown out of immediately. There's consequences. So the first thing we have to do is review. What have you bought? Is there a charge to get out? Is there a tax consequence to get out? And is there some value here? Sometimes you happen to have timed the annuity at the right point, and it's worth more than it would have been in the market. And so maybe you do make the decision to annuitize and take an income stream for life. So we have to evaluate it on its merits at that moment and try to figure out what is the best way to maximize whatever this is for this client today. So if what do you think of the idea of, you know, through 401ks where they want to bring in this idea of we want to provide people income for life. I feel like this is such a a massive land grab for insurance companies and I'm trying to be open-minded, but it's very hard. So is there a case to be able to put an immediate annuity option in a 401k plan? If done right, absolutely. That could be a great you know, this concept has been around for hundreds of years. Pool all of your money and get the mortality credits because we're not all, we don't know how long we're going to live. Somebody's going to die first so we can get more income out of it by pooling that risk together. The concept on its face is excellent and probably would be well suited for a large number of American savers and retirers. The problem is they're going to be loaded with expensive products and they're going to end up worse off than probably just saving and investing in stocks and bonds. And that's unfortunate. So if you're called to testify in an ERISA hearing because they say we need someone who's unbiased, uh, is that going to be your line? Like, yes, if you have a low cost immediate annuity option, great. But otherwise, uh, caveat emptor, buyer beware. This is a tough one because let's say it's a federal rules board that wants to hear testimony. Yes. We have 50 state insurance commissioners. Right. So this is not an easy task to reform the insurance industry. I think it's worth pursuing, um, but unfortunately, that's going to be a long haul. Mm. And I don't think it's as simple as saying just make it low cost because I do believe in a profit motive. I do. I am a capitalist. I know people have to make a living, but we have to figure out a way to stop incentivizing salespeople to sell expensive products that are not serving the clients 
I don't have the answers, but I'd be willing to testify. I'd have to probably study up, though. Okay, of course you would. A student. Um, fill in the blank. Annuities are? Expensive. Okay, next. Give me one other. Boring. Okay, <laughs> and one more. Give me a positive spin. Um, secure. Okay, I like that. So annuities are expensive, boring, and secure. What is your view on when a client comes to you and asks you to do something and you're like, that is stupid, and you're in your head, and they still go ahead and do it? What do you do? Do you have to document that? Are you worried? Like, what happens for you? Well, first of all, any conversation or meeting I have with a client, I take notes. And that's not really because I'm trying to cover liability or anything. It's because that's how I'm a good advisor, yeah. right? Because I need to remember what the last conversation is. But if they come to me with something that I don't agree with, I ask questions. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about what happens if this goes wrong? Have you thought about how long your money may be locked up? Whatever the questions are. And then if they're still wanting to do something that I would never recommend, uh, we talk about, well, what's the appropriate amount of your net worth to be associated with this? Okay. I like that. Yeah. What is the appropriate amount of net worth that you would suggest people have in their company stock? Well, it depends. If it's a public company where you're purchasing Let's say public. stock. We'll say okay. public. Uh, probably zero. <laughs> That's interesting. Okay, I, I'm, I'm looser than you are. I say, okay, 5% of your invested assets you can have in whatever you want to do. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if it's NVIDIA, obviously 100% this year, but, 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 um, <laughs> this year only, um, maybe last year. I went through that. I worked at a bank and I did the share purchase program when I was making like no money mm -hmm. and bought these options. And 15 years later, poof, the money was gone. Mm. So I'm a little bit jaded from that experience. But look, if you believe in the company you work for and um, have some sort of information about how they treat their people and the service you're providing, it's not a bad thing to have 5% okay. go into the you'll stock. Go, you'll go yeah. for 5 Right. All right. What's your favorite movie about um, the financial world? None of them. Really? Aren't they all like terrible? They talk about show the bad stuff. It's like somebody needs to make the positive movie. Really? Yeah. Do they? <laughs> it wouldn't be entertaining. It, it wouldn't be entertaining. What about The Big Short? Did you that as an so, explainer? The Big Short. I loved the book because I yeah. love Michael Lewis. Yes. Okay, so here's a the New funny, Orleans boy. Here's the funny thing about the Big Short. They filmed it in New Orleans. Yeah, and I remember when in my office building they like took down the little thing and put up Lehman Brothers in the in the lobby oh, that day. That's funny. And Brad Pitt was going up and down the elevators, and then um, I'm watching the movie, and they're supposed to be at an airport, and I know it's the convention center, so the movie was very distracting for oh, me. Oh, I see. You you were like, that's not the real thing, but it was a good explainer, right? It was. Okay. It was. What about the movie Wall Street? So I loved the movie Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And I know I wasn't supposed to because Quentin Tarantino has said it was not supposed to entice me to go into the business, but it did. It was a time. Great characters. Yeah. Um, my favorite movie of all time is Trading Places because it was filmed on the Commodities Exchange yes. where I was a young pup trader. And um, – the reason I love that is that it captures like the, um, the the scenes on the floor are actually fairly accurate. Yeah. Not that there's a crop report coming out and everyone's quiet, but the idea that everyone thinks they know something and no one knows anything, which yeah. I love. I love that. Um, well, what else do I need to know about the career of the queen of Ritholtz Wealth Management? Tell us like some parting wisdom if anyone is either in the business or consider, let's let's talk to people who are in the business. Like, what do you want to tell like young advisors right now? They're CFPs, they're CFAs, or they're like chained to their desks at a horrible mm -hmm. wirehouse job. They hate it, but they're scared. What should these younger folks know? The most important thing you can do is find an, someone, an advisor that you respect to apprentice under. Mm -hmm. That's the only way to learn to become a good advisor is to sit in a client meeting with a mentor, hear how they respond to client questions that they didn't prepare for, and then slowly start to become involved in that meeting process until one day you take over. And when you do, it's always going to feel scary at first. When you're the lead advisor in the beginning, it's always going to be scary until you start to 
develop a level of comfort. And the best thing you can do, because if you've got your CFP, you know how to do a financial plan, is to study psychology and all the softer side skills that you need. George Kinder has some great you know, training and books on how to do life planning, how to motivate people, um, how to be a better listener. So seek out those kind of books and podcasts and knowledge and less so about markets and financial planning because if you've passed the CFP, you know how to do it. Yeah, and also uh, when we talk about financial advisory and you know, going back to the beginning between accurate and precision, mm -hmm. the way I've always thought about financial planning is the way that my same friend, my surgeon friend, likes to talk about medicine. She's like, it's only half science. The other half is art. Wow. It's and true. to be clear, that is exactly the world of investment advice and financial planning. Um, is it a complete ripoff to pay somebody to manage your money but not get financial advice? Is that a ripoff? I believe so. Mm. Unless it's very specifically like, I am going to allocate a part of my portfolio to this active strategy as an investment manager, not as a financial advisor, right? I'm gonna put money with this private equity fund or this manager mm -hmm. of small cap stocks. Other than that, if you're paying a financial advisor, they should be doing financial planning for you. God damn it, you're right. Because it's free, you can get it, you can yeah. get it for free. Well, I mean, this is the difference in how the business has evolved since we, or you especially, and me 100 years before you, um, really entered it. And I think that that's actually the positive change, that it used to be that a company was like, I will manage your money and I'll throw in a financial plan for free, mm -hmm. right? And now the smartest advisors, the CFPs, the CFAs, even the CPAs who have that other designation, PFS, PFS. right, which is like a goofy group of, they, they look at their shoes first, but then do look up at you. Yes. Um, those folks, I think that all those people understand that they lead with the consultive relationship. Let me figure out who my client is. And then we'll use those investments to get you where you need to go. But it's just not the most important thing. All right. Last question. What is the biggest mistake that people make in their total financial planning picture? What do you think is the most, the, the most common biggest mistake? Not having a plan. There you go. And then, but on the flip side, very few retirees who have money mm -hmm. spend their money. They're, they they die with more. They freaked out. They don't know how to enjoy themselves. Yeah. They die with more. And look, if you have a huge philanthropic goal, if you really want to leave all your money to your children, go for it. But you should also, and I always say, you've got to enjoy the fruits of your labor. What was the point? I know. Money's uh, just a tool. And also, like, you can enjoy a little bit on the way, too. Right. It doesn't have to be all and or I'm nothing. And I'm doing that right now. Right? Yeah. Like, I don't have to maximize my savings. My kids are only going to be four and seven one year. Like, I need to pay up Disney World, I think. Really? I, I got to do it soon. Did you hear the boys talking about Disney on the recent podcast? And I, so. uh, I, I wanted to ask, you are close to Disney. Is that, um, are your kids too, seven is okay. Four is too young? Four is probably too young. But if I wait too long, I don't know. I probably I'm thinking 10 it. and seven is good. Probably. Right? Yeah. If you've got a financial question, it's so easy. Just go to jillonmoney.com, which is where I'm sure you have bookmarked that site. Click the Contact Us button. Write us a note. Let us know what's going on. And of course, please, if you'd like to join us live, check that box. Don't forget to sign up for the free weekly newsletter. It comes out every single Friday. Mark does such a great job with that. And of course, my book is still for sale, The Great Money Reset. Change your work, change your wealth, change your life. That's where it came up. I came up with that tagline. Get it? Cool. All right. Subscribe to us on the Odyssey app or wherever you find your favorite podcast. And don't forget to do something nice for someone else today. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you tomorrow.